the beginning of November, and we are up in the Valais de Joux, which is uh, one of the great centers of the watchmaking universe and certainly one of the great centers of watchmaking in Switzerland. It's here that you'll find many of watchmaking's most storied names, both independent and uh, non-independent brands. And we're here today talking with uh, a son of the Valais de Joux, uh, Mr. Romain Gauthier. And uh, thank you so much for making time for us. Um, it's really, really exciting to be here. I haven't had a chance to visit your factory before. And uh, there's an incredible number of uh, really beautiful, high value manual processes going on here, which, uh, which we're gonna get to. But for those of us who might not be quite as familiar with your personal history and with your work, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, just kind of how you got into watchmaking? Because I know that it wasn't the first choice for you, despite having been born in Le Sentier and despite having uh, grown up here, you actually didn't set out to become a watchmaker to begin with. Yes, so thank you so much, Jack. Uh, sure. And a pleasure for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will say, you know, the, probably when you're born in a place that uh, is dedicated mainly for one thing, uh, I was not really with the spirit of a followers. I was doing individual sport for, uh, for example, bicycling, skiing. And um, it's right, I, I was not necessarily super attracted because I have grew up with all of the brands as a and I liked that, but yes. And I was um, driving by one of my passion, which is the music, uh, sound equipments and all of that. And when I started um, the technical school in the Vallée de Joux, it was related to that because at that time, the electronic was one of the discipline, uh, was teacher uh, at the school. And I said, Romain, do that is what you like, is uh, you, you, your passion. And um, in fact, I started with that. And after six months, I understood that Roma electronic is too abstract for you. And mm. uh, luckily, I was the first year of education in electronic was dedicated to uh, the practice, I will say, was mechanic. And this is how, you know, I started to use file. Uh, to doing, you know, the, the cubes, uh, which is classical in precision mechanic to do, mm -hmm. and how to, I got the feeling with, with the metal. And uh, I started to switch, and uh, this is how I will say, uh, I turned all of my education with a precision mechanic and constructor, which is, I will say, the level of engineer, more practical and less theoretical, yes. So, and... Uh, after that, I did my military school and I came back in the watchmaking because my first job was, uh, I got in, uh, my first uh, uh, job for parts manufacturing in Francois Goulet in Le Brassu. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in 98. And uh, I came back finally by the production of parts. And you founded your company in 2005. And uh, did you start out already in the beginning determined to um, have as much traditional fine watch, making content in your watches as possible? Was that an objective right from the start? Yeah. It was really at the starting. When I did my, my MBA after, the, after those diploma between 2000 and 2002, I analyzed the position of the brand. And it was important for me to think about, when I did my MBA, I had that vision to do something in watchmaking. So mm -hmm. my final thesis was 120 pages of what we are today, collectible, with a high level of, uh, of uh, finishing and quality. Mm -hmm. And this is not, I will say, like industrial or, or you know, handmade in the thinking. Right. And I clearly found that in that space, and my reference was Philippe. Was Philippe, Philippe Dufour. Dufour. Yeah, exactly. And he was almost alone, you know, in that, uh, that top of the thing. And, I'm, and I said, and I have the, uh, the mapping that I was here, and the goal was to go closest to, uh, to Philippe. So would you say that Philippe Dufour was really um, the person most responsible for kind of uh, giving you an education in depth in what uh, fine hand finishing actually is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he gave me the green light, uh, literally, because when I did my MBA, I, I disturbed him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally that, with question, with, uh, with all of that, and how we have grown our relationship is because I, won, I was one of the persons who disturbed him a lot, but at the end really did something. 
Now, the, um, the, the watch world back in 2005 was very, very different than it was today. This is before really um, social media kind of took over how uh, watch collectors can communicate with each other and how brands communicate. Um, what was the environment like then uh, when you launched your watches into the universe for the first time? How did you, um, how did you sort of get the word out? For me, you remember that time was already with, I remember about the, the Concord watch with the, the cables, the vertical tourbillon yeah, at that time. Yeah. Oh, the, you're talking about the quantum gravity tourbillon. Yeah. Yeah, that crazy thing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And when I launched, I was with my simple two hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> you see, so I knew that it will be complicated. And I will say I was accepted uh, by, by the world of collectors um, because it was my own movement. Mm -hmm. from scratch with new wheels, my own wheels, uh, the S shape of the screws. So no, nobody could see something similar in another brand. You see what I mean? So right. it was, okay, that young guy did from, from scratch what he did. And for sure, the level of finishing was already influenced with Philip. I remember the, yeah. the first time that I, uh, I have showed to, to him the, uh, the prototype, and it was a 45 degrees beveling. And he was looked at and said, oh man, you have to do rounded beveling. It will be much more nicer. And, and yes, and we, we switched from the prototype to the rounded beveling with the HM. Right. And uh, it gave me a lot of influence and understanding about that important things. And yes, when we have presented that, I will say we were with, I will say the level of rounded beveling, sharp, uh, sharp angular, internal uh, uh, beveling. Nice sharp internal corners, yeah. yeah. Hand guilloche dial uh, with the classical way, gold dial. So I, I had tried at that time to say, yes, it's a simple movement, but with a lot of soul and spirit of watchmaking, fine watchmaking. I mean, it's interesting that you bring up the quantum gravity. I remember seeing uh, the launch of that watch at, Bas at Basel World, and, um, you know, it's a... It's, uh, kind of hard to understand if you weren't actually there, just what a completely crazy time it was in watchmaking. I mean, people were trying, uh, you know, the Harry Winston Opus series yeah. uh, was going on. People were trying really, really crazy stuff. So in this like bananas world of hyper complications yep. where um, nobody stops to ask whether they should, they just, you know, ask if they, if they could. Yes. Um, and you see precision manufacturing um, being used to do absolutely anything that anyone could think of. Along you come with your uh, quiet little hand finished, you yep. know, movement, and you were really sort of alone. Yeah, and I. I mean, not not entirely. But. Yeah, yes, yes, but the. Yeah, that was you know I grew up here, and and for me I will say, the brand that you have in the Vallée de Joux from AP, uh, GLC, uh, Breguet, Blancpain, uh, it's classical fine watchmaking. Mm -hmm. And you clearly see the first watch is spirit of that, yeah. And uh, I could, you know, be crazy directly, but I grew up here, so I have a certain DNA of how oh, he's a fine watch. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. When you um, when you set out to design a movement, you know, there are watchmakers and watches which are really kind of all about the exterior, about the habillage, about the case. Um, and uh, the movement is kind of, a, it's, it's there to make the hands go around, basically. <laughs> um, and you take a completely different approach. You're one of those um, watch designers who creates watches where the movement is really the star of the show. You might say the movement is the watch. And, you know, the apotheosis of that, I think, is uh, probably the logical one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the design process behind that particular movement and, and then maybe about movements in general? Yeah. Like what to you makes an interesting movement design? Mm -hmm. I took a lot of influence about, I will say, historical uh, design, you know, with uh, the independent bridges, uh, you know, to respect the German way, the English, and uh, what we were able and what was famous, I will say, in the, in the Vallée de Joux with mm -hmm. the finger bridge, with uh, that kind of, uh, of design. Uh, the logical one for me was an important step because I understood that uh, I was thinking about, you know, when I was young, I love cars, I, was, I had a lot of ideas about what to do. And I was dreaming about the art center of college of La Tour de Paix. But, you know, a private school and possible for my parents, uh, I would say, to sure. do that. And at the end, you know, uh, I was always influenced about aesthetic, about design. And um, the logical one for me was really a step to say, Romain, you don't want 
you collectors think about you are classical or you are very sporty and contemporary. So how to do something that give an harmony, a space for those two worlds of very classical and, and modern approach. Right, right. And the logical one was really my, was my, was my work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, how to integrate that with a feeling about something mechanical, but not just classical. The fundamental problems in watchmaking haven't changed in probably 500 years. Um, although 500 years ago they weren't aware of magnetism as a problem. Uh, but they are the effect of gravity on the regulating organs of the watch, isochronism, the effects of temperature, and now we're aware of the effects of magnetism as well. So with these fundamental problems, what made you, the, the, the logical one, the snail cam and the chain, this is an attempt to address uh, the problem of isochronism, correct? My reason of, uh, I will say, the logical one was related to a physical point of view. To say, how can, could we ask to a watch to be precise if the input output of energy is not stable? Right. So there is no miracle, no mechanism can, can achieve that result. Any, uh, like a human, if you do a marathon if you, uh, and you don't take uh, you know, some energy, your performances will go down. Right. So, so means that you need to have a stable energy at the entry if you really want to talk about precision. And for me, the goal of the logical one to say was to say, in physics, you should ask, what is the precision of your watch at 24 hours? Not what is the precision of your watch, because it's not stable. Right. And my goal was, with a logical one and that kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of principle, you could say, what is the precision of your watch? Because it's the same at 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, or, or one hour. Mm -hmm. One of the sort of attractions of mechanical horology is that a mechanical watch, at least in theory, is something that can be fixed by a watchmaker at his bench. Um, I agree. If you have nothing but traditional hand tools, you should still be able to repair a watch. You should be able to bring it back to life. But we're seeing a lot of use nowadays of um, increasingly, I, I don't like the term high-tech materials so much, but um, you know, material, say, let's say materials that require uh, highly technical fabrication techniques like silicon components. Um, how do you feel, what do you feel is the place of these, these sorts of components in, in, in watchmaking in general and in fine watchmaking in particular? Yeah, I think the, the evolution, because it's an evolution, uh, is absolutely normal. And I think it's a need, you know, uh, the watchmaking process uh, has not really moved in centuries, you know, the ideas. And one of the most complicated is regarding the, the escapement. There is different type of escapement, but it was always, I will say, a question of efficiency. Right. You know, a lot of uh, lose of, effort, uh, of, of energy. Um, I will say the approach with, with silicon is different. I don't see watchmaking with a plug and play. You take a part and it's working. Right. For me, you know, uh, we will preserve like we do with the beveling, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the DNA, this is the Swiss made watches, this is how I will say we need to have watchmakers. If we open too much about those things, we don't need any more watchmakers. We will need assemblers. It's a part of my concern. It's like if you think about, you know, the beveling, should we continue to do that? No, there is machinery or that, you know, including diamond cutting, and, uh, but we don't talk about the same things. So I see more brands who, do, uh, who are doing that as a laboratory. Right, you, right. You see research and how. Is it going to take over the, what we talk? No, never. So on the subject... I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I hope so also. Um, on the subject of hand finishing, this is something that um, as the size of the audience for fine watchmaking has grown, knowledge of and the ability to evaluate uh, hand finishing has kind of not grown with it. Um, and, you know, earlier we were walking around, uh, around the, uh, the, the factory here and we were, I saw an incredible number of uh, hand processes that, um, you know, truly being done manually that uh, very, very few other watchmakers, very few other watch brands are doing. This is part of the reason that you make, what, 150 watches a year? Yeah, yeah. we do a lot of that. Um, and that kind of 
value added is really, really, uh, it's really phenomenal. The, um, and the, the amount of time that it takes to execute it is a big part of the reason that it was traditionally considered uh, and, and still is considered by people who are interested in it. Um, something to look for and really value added in watchmaking. One of the things you mentioned to me was the number of hours that it takes to produce uh, one particular mm -hmm. part. Yeah. I will say there is different approach, you know, and, and for me, you know, the beveling is an extension needed depending about your design. The big names, they have the best engineer. They have the best designer. They have, I will say, everything because they need to drive quantities. So you cannot be too crazy, I will say, sometimes in engineering because you will affect the price, the numbers of parts, and the, and the reliability, I will say, sometimes. In design, you cannot be too crazy like we do with sharp beveling, with artistic design because you need to fit also with the price and, uh, and the capacity sure, to sure. reproduce. So one of the advantage that I have, I have no box. And I just have, I will say, my pleasure to manage. And I will say what I try to do in my level is I'm born here. I have seen watchmaking all of my life. And I try to give that maturity in watchmaking into our watches. Right, right. And so these are very rare skills. When someone comes to you and they say, uh, Homan, I, 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 I'm a watchmaker. Uh, I'd like to work for you. The quality of your work is very high. And uh, I know how to do hand finishing. Um, that is probably not complete. It's probably not completely true that the person actually knows how to do real traditional hand finishing. You know, I learned in since years um, and and traveling in Japan uh, for so many years that you became a master when you do all the life. There is national treasure who, who are people right. in Japan and consider I would say like this because they have done that all the life right and i understood about that and this is why you know today we have we have a team absolutely dedicate every day of beveling they think i think we are the, at that level because they always do that so yeah I, I, that was something i was really amazed to hear so that the inner uh inner end of the balance spring is fixed to uh, the balance staff to something called a collet. And um, in most watches, it's held in place either with laser welding or, or glue. Yes, exactly. Yep. Uh, but the traditional way to do it is uh, you bend the inner end of the balance spring and you push it through a little hole in the balance staff and then you put a pin in to hold it in place. Yeah. And uh, th I actually tried to do that once, and it's really, really difficult. And <laughs> yes. It's one of those things, like, uh, you, you can't quite understand why anyone would bother to do that anymore, just because it's something that nobody's ever going to see unless they look really, really closely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't actually know if it's even visible in Logical One. But the fact that you insist on using this traditional uh, hairspring pinning technique is, uh, it, it, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Um... That was, you know, the HM was like this, the HMS uh, are also like this. And for me, that was the pure sense of if you are small, you have to do by your own, yeah, yeah. you know. And, uh, and by your own is, you know, with the, the, the classical and historical techniques. And, um, and yes, so I remember when, when I asked about, you know, um, about the, uh, the, the furniture. I will say the balance, the escapement wheel, the hairspring, and all of that. Why I didn't vote? But it's also interesting. Right. Uh, I went to see a big names that everybody knew. <laughs> uh, um, they congrat me uh, uh, on, on what I have achieved, uh, but they didn't accept that uh, uh, I said to them, but I want to do the balance by myself. I want to do the axle, and I just need to know where the hair spring and, and if you can manage that. And they said, no, we do everything. Right. And I said, and also for me, Romain, you don't have the budget for that, so you have to do by your own. And this is, and this is how we did, and we achieve, and, um, and it's perfectly working. And for me, it's one of the beauty, yeah. It's one of the beauty of you, you are sure that the one who has assembly your watch is a real watchmaker and not just an assembler. 
Now, you mentioned earlier um, that there's uh, going to be a, a new building, mm-hmm. uh, um, that there's some new construction going on, which is kind of an exceptional thing for a small manufacturer. Um, you know, this has not been a period of sort of like, it's been a period of dynamic growth, certainly in terms of uh, interest in watches. Um, but for a small manufacturer to actually be able to um, increase its facilities and expand the way in which it exposes itself to the world at the same time retaining quality, that has a lot to do with the fact that you, you are basically your own supplier. Yep, absolutely, yeah. And this was, you know, always a uh, two side of us. I started with the watchmaking side mm-hmm. and um, the first name came and asked me about Romain. Uh, are you able to do that? And uh, this is how I started to buy my first machinery. And I, ne- I knew that at that time, Romain, if you do parts for other one, you will need f- for you. You did your part during holidays and, uh, and, and weekends in, your, in Francois Goulet at, uh, mm-hmm. at that time. But the future things, you will need uh, a machinery. So I started to, to accept to do parts for other ones, I will say. Right. And uh, this side, I will say, of us has grown since that time. And um, uh, yeah, this is an important side that we became, I will say, a kind of specialist, Mm -hmm. which is in the DNA of the watchmaking. The structure of the bridges and the main plate has to be precise and rigid. And with clearly, you know, the the perpendicularity, all of the geometry has to be perfect. So it needs to to be like this. For sure, we also manage all of the key train. And everything related in a watch is precision precision of shape, precision of when an engineer designs a shape of a teeth, it's not to be at the end like this. Right, right. So we talk about always downstairs uh, where we have the, the equipment, we manage the microns. So for you to have an idea, today most of a precision of plus minus two microns is everywhere, on every draw, uh, you know, and, and to manage that, uh, it's not so easy as we can imagine. Sometimes we have hole, you know, uh, when you, where you have to set the jewels. The tolerance is four microns. So you need, we need to do a hole. So it means your tool has to be more precise than the hole. And the, the yeah, extreme thing is that um, when our technician has the person who does the tools, because we do our own tools for the, uh, for the machinery, uh, they ask to him zero tolerance. If they ask the true, the, the hole has to be 0.992 plus minus two microns, they ask a tool of 0.992 tolerance. Yeah, yeah. Zero. And this you need to be autonomous. Otherwise, you know, if you have to order those tools to a supplier, it's again uh, almost impossible. So this is this is really fascinating. The uh, uh, and, and this is an aspect I think of what you do here and of, and of fine watchmaking in general. That uh, I mean, I certainly had never thought about it in quite that way. Um, you know, if you want, if you have a very very precise tolerance, you need a tool that's even more precise than the than the, than the tolerance that you want. Yeah. And if you're ordering supplies made in large batches on an industrial level, you are necessarily going to have greater tolerances than you will in something that you manufacture yourself where you can really, really control down to, you know, a micron, half a micron, um, the tolerances of the part. Which gets me back to the subject of movement finishing. Um, mm-hmm. Because, like, a really beautiful, rounded anglage with lots of sharp internal corners, um, that sort of thing is, uh, it, it's, it's harder to appreciate, perhaps, than some other aspects of the, you know, the externals of a watch, but it's something that you can kind of train yourself to see, and it's something more and more collectors are talking about and looking for. But you can't make something like that if you start out with an inferior, qualitatively inferior movement. Thank you. You are absolutely right, and there is no miracle in the process of from the manufacturing to the end. If you if you fail on many on many sides, right. so the the quest of the perfection is, has to be respected at everywhere and start with the best quality of parts. Right. The cutting, the, uh, the precision, um, everything. And also with the quality of the metal, the quality of the equipments. 
the quality of the quality is everywhere, you know, right, right. and uh, and the quality cost. That's one one of the things on the ground floor. We have equipments that are very costly. Uh, we could have much more, and people will be more impressed about the quantity. It's normal when we see a lot of equipments. It's like right. wow, impressive, but it's not the quantity who, who, who matter. Is really regarding the quality, and it's why we have we have quite. Uh, a few equipments, uh, <laughs> for sure, but um, with a very high quality because this is what we need. And I think that that's a really great place for us. I mean, I feel like this is a conversation that could go on, you know, forever. Um, but what a great place for us to end in, you know, kind of the recognition and, and acknowledgement that what you do here is uh, you pursue the highest possible quality from the very beginning to the very end every step of the production process. And the visible, obvious beauty has many, many, many steps behind it that you don't necessarily see in the final product, but you wouldn't get that final product without all of the effort that preceded it. Yes, exactly. And, and for me, you know, the, when I have collectors who come here to visit, uh, I really explain about what means the handmade. Right. What right. means the handmade. I, I think today we have to think differently with the value of what we are, human. And on every step, you need to have people with a craftsmanship, a knowledge, uh, if you want to go just, uh, I will say, at this level. So it means the handmade is everywhere because it's us, you know. People are thinking about that like numerical machinery, you scan and you get the parts and, uh, and it's gone, you know. So unfortunately not. <laughs> no. yeah. And here, you know, it's difficult to find also the person because there is no school who teach that at that level. Right. You right. teach, uh, 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 um, I will say, a global knowledge about uh, precision mechanic or mechanic. And then after that, it's, per, I, I will say, a kind of specialization that you need to go through and, and learn. And, and manufacturing is years of years of years of experience to know uh, where to go. For example, for you to understand, uh, many brands are equipped to produce the bend plate and the bridges, for example, but not necessarily for the gate train. Because the gate train, you start to talk about the thickness, parts very small, very thin. And when you talk and you start to touch those parts, you get different problems. Tension in the metal. So you cut, but your, your barrel cover is boom, right, like this. Right, right. So how to do? This is the knowledge. How to cut, how to do the ebosh, how to do the finishing, how, and the level of tools that you have will be affected. So means uh, it's not easy at all. Uh, we use the global equipments that is used in the industry because the, the, the watchmaking represents nothing. For, for example, uh, uh, a name of machinery, let's say Morisaiki, the watchmaking is, they cannot consider to right. develop a machinery dedicated for that. You know, the, um, the beauty that we see in a finished watch from Romain Gautier is, it, that's, that's where it starts, right? I mean, it starts with the highest possible quality of materials and kind of goes from there. And what you're really doing is you're, uh, I'm, I think it was Michelangelo who was supposed to, who was supposed to have said that you, uh, um, the way you make a beautiful sculpture is you just remove everything that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> um, and your processes here are kind of like that. You know, I mean, you are, you are uh, exposing and, and making visible the hidden inner beauty of the material that you're working with. And um, I think that the thing that has really impressed me coming here for the first time is, uh, I mean, I knew that theoretically there were a lot of manual processes that go on here. Um, but to actually see them done is another thing entirely. And I think that one thing we should all remember uh, over the next few years as uh, interest in fine watch making continues to grow, and I'm, I'm sure that it will, is that if a company is really doing this stuff, they're going to show you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Real Jack. pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>